Okay, so we're here this afternoon on June 17th. I'm Professor Nicholas Wood and I'm here to talk to Professor John Hardy, who's the C. David Marsden and Memorial Lecturer at this year's Congress of Movement Disorders in Dublin. So John, um, if, we'll, if we could just uh, make a wind back the clock to the early days and what first, how your first career steps went about and take us through your early life. So I, I started, actually I started by working on Parkinson's disease. Uh, actually, I started as a neuropharmacologist uh, looking at uh, dopamine uptake and release in the substantia nigra and the striatum in a, in a lab at Imperial run by Harry Bradford. So I, d I started by doing synaptosomal work uh, at, at that time, looking, in, you know, looking for uh, both glutamate and dopamine uptake and release. Mm. And uh, from there I uh, continued to do neurochemistry, moving to Newcastle. Um, started to work on Alzheimer's disease a little bit in Newcastle, but um, you know, then I, start, <coughs> I thought that perhaps genetics was going to be a more uh, interesting way to go to understanding diseases, and so I started to work on the genetics of Alzheimer's disease. And um, what made you interested in neuroscience? What are the sort of things that... Uh, you know, I don't uh, know really. I mean, I, was, I, I did my degree in Leeds, and uh, I had a lecturer there, Tony Turner, who was a neuros who still is a neuroscientist. And uh, I did a I, I was always interested in neuroscientists neuroscience, and I did a project with him in the in his lab as my as part of my undergraduate. But really, I'd always wanted to do neuroscience. So I can't remember really why you know why I always wanted to do it. And do you think it's been a good? Two or three decades in, in neuroscience, sure. not just for you, but for the field generally? Sure, yes, sure. Actually, it's frightening, isn't it? It's actually 40 years, in fact, mm -hmm. from 1973 to 2000 and whatever it is, 2012, 39 years. So, so um, yes, it has been. I'm just thinking, actually, about my finals project. And uh, my finals project was on what the mechanism of uh, antidepressants w were. Uh, and actually, you know, thinking about that project, that has not actually moved that far. But in general, neuroscience has, of course, moved an enormous way, and, gen and genetics, has especially, has been part, a big part of that. Now can we go into the sort of genetics of uh, movement disorders, principally? And of course, you've done many, many pieces of work there. What do you think is the standout things that you've contributed to, and do you think the fields move forward on in the last, let's say, 10, 15 years when the Lexinex has really got going? Uh, well, movement disorders, uh, actually, movement disorders, I would say two things. Uh, uh, you know, finding the synuclein triplication <coughs> in the Iowa kindred was a, was a nice thing. Um, and I think that has really been an important piece of work which has stood the test of time. But actually, I have to say that I think that the main thing I've contributed to the field is, uh, is um, bringing in really talented young people, starting with Mike Hutton on frontotemporal dementia, which is, of course, on the edge of movement disorders, uh, and then uh, Andy Singleton and Matt Farah and Mark Cookson, so uh, all started as postdocs in my lab. So uh, in many ways, you know, although I'm proud of my own contribution, I actually think that um, the contribution of my postdocs has been actually more than mine, actually. Uh, mm. But it's, it's been great to see the field develop. Of course, the genome-wide association studies, which we're both part of, you know, this has been something which I saw coming and, uh, you know, have contributed to. But, you know, it's been, mm. it's been as an organiser as much as anything. Uh, so, you know, I'm proud of my contribution, but a lot of it has been done, actually, by others, as, as actually you well know, yeah. Nick. <laughs> and um, so the so nuclear triplication, what do you think that's telling us about the disease, or has told us about the disease? I, I think it pointed the way, uh, well, it pointed as uh, 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 the way to saying genetic variability in expression was important. And that's turned out to be important not only for, um, for Parkinson's disease, but also for all of the other neurodegenerative diseases. It, I think it pointed the way for progressive supranuclear palsy. It pointed the way for finding amyloid duplications in Alzheimer's disease. And it's pointed a, a, the way 
for the genome-wide association studies too, where we're seeing that normal genetic variability contributes to risk. So, um, you know, that was an exciting piece of work, and mm. I think it's it has had a lot of implications. And did, well, how far, where do you think we're going to? Uh, where, how far we're we going to get along with finding genes, as you and I know, is now becoming, I won't say easy, but easier than it was. Um, are we near the end of a certain road before going to another one? I think we, we are. I think we are coming to, certainly for the Mendelian disease, as you and I have discussed many, many times, actually, in our own lab meetings, are, are there many other Mendelian genes to find? I think that there uh, are probably no, well, I think there's no fully penetrant autosomal dominant genes to find. There might be um, impenetrant, nearly autosomal dominant genes to find still. I think there are going to be a few rare recessive mm. uh, genes still to find. Uh, the genome-wide association studies have, have acquired an enormous momentum uh, and they will find risk variants, but we're reaching the end of doing that because the, you know, obviously we've now, we're now analyzing 20,000 samples uh, and the next stage will be to analyze 60,000 samples and that sort of, and I'm not sure it's going to be worth doing that in terms of the bang for the buck mm. and the analysis time. So that road is, is coming to an end. Then as we've been discussing, and we will discuss at this meeting, exome sequencing is going to find other things like leukocerebrosidase, but not that many things perhaps. So I think that the era of, of, gene of that type of genetic analysis is coming to an end. It's going to take us a long time to work out how genes might interact with each other. That's going to take us a long time. Uh, but I think that the m major push now is going to be on cell biology. And I think that the, it, it's clear that that's where the, the holdup is. Yeah, you think that's where the logjam is, is, is how we, because we suddenly get off a super highway of finding genes to, I don't want to anal put the analogy, but something rather slow to, exactly. make a, to knock out a gene in the cell model, make a mouse model and so forth. I mean, yeah. we've got 15 Mendelian genes for PD about. We've got 20 or 30, 20 or 30 genome-wide association hits. Let's say there's another three or four besides glucocerebrosidase of high impact, rarer variants. That's for 40, let's say that we're going to end up with 40 genes to analyze. And, you know, looking at Alzheimer's disease, we've had thousands of people working on APP for 30, 30 years. We've now got 40 genes to work on. This is an enormous amount of work. And that's where, the, if I was a young professor, a young assistant professor, coming in now I would I that's where I would be that's what I would do I wouldn't I wouldn't do genetics now if I was a young guy coming in picking up on that point then if you talk about the challenges um, one thing I did want to ask you was the challenges to the the youth now coming in partly intellectual we talked about there but also career planning you know the funding strata the situation we find ourselves in you know what kind of advice would you give to somebody, maybe both academic, like the one we just talked about, but other things as well. How would you feel for a young professor now, or assistant professor? It's a very tough, it's very, very tough, as, as you know well too. I mean, I was a lecturer in 90, when, so I was an assistant professor. I got my assistant professorship in uh, when I was 30 years old. I can't imagine anyone getting assistant professorships now. And that with an assistant professorship came some measure of security. So we have, as you well know, large numbers of very talented people who are in their, early, typically in their early 30s, who are looking to set up their own labs. And yet the bar for that, for getting funding for your own independence is extremely high. And it makes their lives very difficult because work, the type of work that we do involves large, large consortium and yet consortia, and yet they are expected to have first author papers in major journals. Um, this makes it very difficult for them. They're, that to get good data, they have to be in large consortia, and yet to be appreciated for for that good data, they have to have first author papers. That's a very difficult circle, circle square to circle. Uh, it's very difficult for them. Uh, what they need to find is rich 
well-funded groups which they can gradually bud off and that's the only way of doing it. I can't imagine uh, a young lecturer starting in a university uh, with no background for example in Parkinson's disease and being successful. What they have to do is they have to kind of um, be in part of a large group and gradually bud off and take them, mm. put some of the work with them. But it's a very, that's a very tough thing to do. Very tough. And if I was to say, sort of genetics, finding things, I think we both agree, finding genetic variants is, you know, we're coming off the final bend or something. But what would you, would you be thinking about genomic technologies? For, if you were a professor, if you wanted to do, if you didn't want to do cell biology and you did want to stick around RNA, DNA or proteins, what do you think the action is going to be in the well, next five I mean, or ten years? Uh, so, two, two things. One thing we're doing and the other that we're not, and we've just m briefly mentioned already, but th what I'm doing, where I'm putting most of the work in my lab is looking at genetic variability and expression. And uh, by making databases of brain expression, moving towards databases of cellular expression mm -hmm. and looking at genetic variability in that. And that, I think, is an area where there's an enormous amount of work to do and an enormous amount of emerging, exciting emerging data. We're, we're doing that, and, and I think that's a good area to be in. And the other is looking at interactions between genes. Mm -hmm. I think it is going to be an important, an important part of the work. I think it requires a set of skills I don't have. So, I mean, it really requires, it actually requires, you know, computing and mathematical skills more than it requires lab skills. Mm -hmm. And that's going to be an important area which is going to be, I think I would really encourage people to, to, to take on. And I'm encouraging for people in my group to think about that area. Yeah, no, I think that's right. I think it's a very challenging but exciting at time to be involved in molecular neuroscience. Do you, um, do you have any role models? I mean, you mentioned a lecturer that maybe turned you on towards neuroscience, but any other people through your time that uh, either dragged you along or pushed you along or encouraged you? Um, oh, Bob Williamson. Bob Williamson was a real role model for me. He was my head of department at, um, at St Mary's, uh, so I was a pharmacologist and I was hired basically to teach pharmacology. He was a molecular geneticist uh, and I learned from him molecular genetics um, from the other people in the department. But more than anything, what I learned from him was uh, the idea that you should just... Uh, the way to succeed was to be confident. I mean, it's, it's almost... Uh, it was al it's almost... Uh, you know, almost a, a virtuous circle. So I remember, I remember just after I'd started at St Mary's and I had never done any molecular biology at all, not anything, not anything. And I was stood in my lab and I was trying to do, you know, to isolate DNA from a sample or something very simple. We'd not published any work. And I heard Bob Williamson coming down the corridor with uh, Peter Newmark, who was the ed then the editor of Nature. And Bob Williamson was saying to Peter Newmark, as he came down the corridor, I'd like to introduce you to somebody I think is going to be the future of British molecular neuroscience. I think he's a really talented person, and I think he is going to be the go-to person. So if you ever need to have an editorial written about the future of neuroscience in Nature, mm. this is who I'd recommend. And he pushed the door open, and he said, Peter Newmark, I'd like to introduce you to John Hardy. And uh, it was such total bullshit. It was such total bullshit, but it works. Hmm. It, it, it <laughs> works. It was just, I mean, it was just the triumph of belief. And I have to say that I read an interview by Noel Gallagher uh, in, um, in NME or something, and Noel Gallagher said that he decided that he and the, an Oasis decided they were going to say, keep saying in all their interviews, we're the best band, the best rock and roll band in the world. And if you keep saying it long enough, people believe it. <laughs> and, and, and he said that was what they did and it worked. And I have to say that that's what I learned from Bob, really. <laughs> you just simply have no shame. Just say, we're the best. We can do it. And you just keep saying it and eventually people start to believe it. So that isn't the only thing I learned from Bob. He was a very smart scientist. But that sense of uh, that can-do attitude was absolutely something that Bob brought. And, and, it's, and it's a testament to that, that when you look around, 
when you look around, you see lots of people from his group. Jill Bates, who who was absolutely key in the Huntington's project, was from his lab. Um, Lizzie Fisher, who's made an enormous contribution to motor neuron disease, was in his lab. John Collins, uh, who's head of the Prion group, was jointly between Bob and myself. Uh, but you know, I'm sure he learnt an enormous. I mean, there was an enormous number, and that's just that's just within the neuroscience. I mean, he also has people who work on heart disease and and uh, cystic fibrosis. Kay Davis was his postdoc for Duchenne dystrophy. You know, I mean, he has a he really this can do. Nobody's better than you. Attitude is something that really I think people need to take on board. If we can return to the science momentarily, so. Do you think now, that, or in the next year or two or three, that we're going to have all the Mendelian and maybe some of the more risk variance pieces on a jigsaw, shuffling them around, trying to put them together? Yes, I do. I think we are. And I actually think we're close to that already. Uh, we're close to, I mean, so we know, you know this better than I, really, but we know a mitochondrial set of genes already for Parkinson's disease. We have a skeleton of how those interact. We, you know, Helen plum uh, Alex Whitworth, as well as, of course, as the original people point, p putting Pink and Parkin together in Drosophila, you know, that we have some excellent data showing that the, Parkin, the, the recessive m genes map to a mitochondrial pathway. No doubt, that's one pathway. Then we, of course, w because of um, glucocerebrosidase mutations, ATP13A2, that already brings in lysosomes. We, there must be a lysosomal component to this. And there's work that uh, you and I both know about, uh, implicating perhaps LERC2 in, in a related pathway. So we're beginning to see uh, perhaps mitophagy and autophagy. Mitophagy in the recessive diseases and autophagy more generally as being part of the uh, process. So I think this is very exciting and I think that those pathways will be nailed down further in the next couple of years. And I mean... We write grants and we always write in our grants something along the lines of it's only by discovering and understanding molecular pathways will we get more rational therapy. And of course it is therapy. This is a disease, Parkinson's we talk about principally, that we help symptomatically and have been able to for 40 years and some very good treatments, but not, nobody yet can influence the course of the disease. Are you optimistic uh, for the that they will now make rational steps into slowing down the process of this disorder? I, I am optimistic, I'm, but I would say cautiously mm. optimistic. Of course, the disease which is furthest along this pathway is Alzheimer's disease, where the same approach, finding um, the amyloid gene and finding the presenilin genes and mapping an amyloidogenic pathway to the autosomal dominant disease has led to amyloid therapies. Those amyloid therapies are being tested now and they report later this year, so in October and November 2012. They have the same logic as the therapies we want to get for Parkinson's mm. disease. I think that if those, if, if those start to show signs of working, then I think we'll really be confident that we're on the right road. If they don't, I think that we will face a period of uncertainty and it'll be difficult to know It'll be difficult to know. I mean, I think that uh, we just simply won't know what the way forward is going to be. I mean, I, I think that we, we have to believe that rational approaches are the right mm. approaches, but it's going gonna, it's gonna to give us a, a crisis in confidence if those don't work. And the Movement Disorder Society, uh, since its inception, has played a very significant role in obviously pulling together people interested in this field and talents. What's your take on the Movement Disorder Society and how it's performed? You know, uh, you know that's an unexpected, a totally unexpected question. I have been a member of the Movement Disorder Society. I'm not a member of the Movement Disorder Society now. Does that mean we have to stop the interview <laughs> now? I just, I, uh, I actually don't like joining societies. I, I don't it's like joining in the Groucho Marx <laughs> I, yeah, just, view of the world. Yeah, I, I don't like. I was in the Scouts when I was a kid, and I was, uh, and that was enough for me in terms of societies. I, I'm always, you know, I like the meetings. I like. I do like the meetings. I, I don't like being in societies. Um, so 
I, I tend to try and avoid them. I, I'd keep away from them. But, you know, I, of course, I come to the Movement Disorder Society's meetings. This is I hardly ever miss one. So, so uh, you know, I don't want to I don't want to denigrate my hosts because you know I'm mm. glad they exist. But I'm not a member. Mm. Yeah, no, I think they do. I, these I, I know what you mean by societies generally, but I think it does help sure. foster the intellectual milieu to speed I mean, things course, along, doesn't it? Actually, I'm a PhD, as you well know. Uh, the uh, I think that it's very useful and increasingly difficult to have a forum where PhDs and MDs meet properly. Yeah. It's really a pro this is really a problem. I think if you have PhDs on their own, they will get t they'll go d down the route of doing perfectly di designed experiments, which will be of no clinical benefit. If you have MDs on their own, they will disappear into just reporting anecdotes. And you really need both sides. Both sides together can contribute much more than either individually. And it's so difficult now with the increasing pressure, especially, well, the, with the pressure on both sides. The, the PhDs now have a terrible career structure. Uh, it's very difficult for them to succeed. They have to be single-minded and it fosters selfishness. Uh, they have to be single-minded to succeed. And the MDs are continually being pulled away from research by their clinical commitments and their clinical training. So there's an enormous pressure on both sides to divorce. Mm. And yet, if they divorce, the research will definitely not work. Mm. So this is a tough this is tough, and we need arenas in which they can be brought together. Of and there's sort of different science models throughout the world, and you've worked in places that have different models. You NIH, which is a, which is away from a clinical environment, and now at UCL, you're right next door to a hospital. And I'm not asking you to draw comparisons between the two; they're very different towns and things. But uh, do you have, during your career, do you have favourite views of how not even favourite places, but favourite views of how things are structured uh, like that? I think, you know, I love, uh, we are very lucky, both you and I, Nick, we're very lucky. Uh, NIH is fant was fantastic because of the resources. It was fantastic because of the resources. UCL is fantastic, and Queen Square is fantastic because of the clin clinical samples that it mm. brings. We are, are extremely lucky, you and I particularly, because we can you know, leverage one with the other. We have very good ties to the NIH labs, so we can leverage our samples to their money to some extent, and that's a very good way of doing it. And, and uh, you know, we get very talented young clinicians come through UCL who we manage to partly train at NIH and partly train within, with, you know, at, at, within our own labs. So that's a very good way of we're very lucky to be able to do that, and that's a good system. It's very, every, it's very difficult to do it all on one side. Yeah. I mean, it's very difficult to generate, as you know, the enormous amount of money that you require for genetic analysis mm. now. And on that point, what I want th things I wanted to point out, and I know you, this is things you feel quite strongly about, and I have to say I, I completely agree with you, and uh, you've helped frame my thinking on this, is about open access to data once it's generated. I mean, do you, I mean, is that a good thing? I think I know the answer to that, what you're going to say there, but, but why is it a good thing? And is it speeding up progress in the field by, make, by data sets being, once the, the, the scientist who's generated them has had their chance to write them up and score the goal, if you like, uh, they make them very publicly available? Sure. And, you, and let's, I mean, let's, t t you know, so we're looking for, for hits within sequence data. And no doubt we'll find, the pro let's call it the primary hit, but down the line, you know, we'll be looking, we'll be looking for, mo let's say, modifier genes in the same data set. This, these studies might only happen in 10 or 15 years, and actually long after you and I have moved on. Hmm. And so it's obviously important that the data has a way of being outside our control. So just for that type of reason, I think it's very important to make data publicly available and uh, as easily available as possible. I mean, we have many uh, elements of data which are publicly available yet require enormous amounts of form filling mm. and uh, to get hold of. And, you know, what this inhibits is people having a quick look, which is often the important thing. Mm. If you have to 
spend weeks of filling in forms <laughs> to look at data. You don't actually just do the casual look, which might be important. So the easier it's available, the better, definitely. So if you could look back on 20 years, maybe 30 years, um, would you change anything? Would you put either for your career or are you happy the way it's turned out? You know, or? I'm not, uh, you know, I'm... I'm very happy the way it's turned out. I'm very happy, I've, and I've got a great job. I love my job. It's a, it's a dream job. I'm well. It's great colleagues. Great. It? <laughs> it's just I love my job. You know, I have had periods in my career. I, I can think of two or three which I'm not going to discuss right now, <laughs> where I've not been happy for you know at work for a year or so. But you know. Uh, you know, I wouldn't change things. No, no, I wouldn't change things. I've really, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm happier now in my job than I've ever been before. Actually, I love my job now, um, but I, I, I'm, a, I've always been a high serotonin type of guy. Mm. I just want to ask you one final question on going along those lines of work-life balance. It's a modern phrase. I'm, I find it slightly irritating one personally, but what's your view on that? Do you, do you think you achieve it? Um, Let's just see. <laughs> yeah, what the, what the email says. Yeah, what the email says. I, you know, when I go on holiday, my partner says uh, uh, that I'm only allowed access to my BlackBerry for an hour a day. I, I am a bit of, I, I am trying to, to, to be more, have more home life than, than, than before. But, you know, I love my job, so... It isn't, you know. Work's not a chore. Work's not a w work's not a chore, as you know. Sometimes, uh, it, sometimes things come up which are a pain to deal with. But in general, uh, I don't worry too much about my work-life balance. Okay. Well, I'd like to thank you for your time, John. Thanks, Nick. Thanks.